Hello, my darlings, and welcome to Rotten to the Core, the history podcast where we use our faithful scrying mirror to peek into the past and reveal some rotten apples who tainted our history in hopes of learning a lesson for our own good. Let's all learn together on how to cast our light into all the shadows. Don't forget the power that we all contain to change this world for the better. Use your own gifts to help someone and witness some true magic. You'll learn that with me, I will overshare and tell everything about myself that I feel comfortable with. I honestly hate hiding anything about who I am, and I share in hopes that just even one person might benefit from some story from my life. Everything has a purpose, so let's find out what purpose these rotten people can give us. I'm your host, Joshua Waters, the not-so-evil queen. We're grounded, shielded, and ready for an adventure into the parallels of time. So, in the words of one of my favorites, Shania, let's go girls. Magic mirror on the wall, hear our cry and hear our call. Show us some of the most rotten ones in history, and make them no longer a mystery. Show us so we know, and show us so we grow. Take us through time and space, and give us their rotten face. All right, my dearies, the image is starting to come in clearly. Let's answer some of our queries. I see that we are in the Caribbean during the 1600s. It's a hot and sunny day and the water is the most transparent color of blue. And I see a ship approaching on the horizon. I've not been back here in centuries. I forgot how beautiful it really is. Well, before all the pollution and overcrowding we have today. Uh Uh-oh. I see a red flag above those sails. It seems that our lesson today must be on a pirate. That red flag means that no mercy will be given and no life will be spared. So, no safe word. If memory serves correct, that ship is one of the most bloodthirsty, merciless pirates of all. Francois Lolonnais and he gave off major compensating vibes the last time I saw him. First, let's go back a bit further and get to know his whole story. The year is 1635 and a baby boy was just born in the seaside village of La Salle de Olenay in France. His birth name was Jean-David Nou, and it seems that he was born into a pretty poor family. I couldn't find anything else about his family, so it must not be detrimental to our lesson. As soon as he was able to, Jean David agreed to become an indentured servant on the island of Española, modern-day Haiti and the Dominican Republic. He was seeking to make a name for himself, some freedom, and escape the inheritance of poverty passed down in his family. For those who aren't aware, an indentured servant would agree to work for a certain number of years in return for things like transportation, lodging, and food. After, at the end of their contract, they were free to go wherever they pleased. Occasionally, though, if you can believe it, sometimes the wealthy men in charge would attempt to keep them working past their contract. It was a real coin toss. You had no family at your aid usually, unless your brother might have come with you, or any real authorities to inform of your mistreatment. These servants were, more often than not, severely mistreated and definitely overused. I think I just found my next tramp stamp tattoo saying, severely mistreated and definitely overused. Bless my heart. By 1650, Jean David was soon on his way across the Pacific Ocean towards his new stomping grounds. I wonder, though, if he had any idea he would turn into one of the deadliest pirates in history. Or maybe he was more optimistic about becoming something more honorable? Within 10 years, by 1660, Jean David was finished with the servitude 
or ran away. It's not really known which one. Probably the latter. It doesn't seem that he planned at all during the decade though, as he instantly went to wandering the islands until deciding to try his hand at some buccaneering on the island of St. Dominique, which is now Haiti. This is when he started robbing Spanish ships from the Spanish West Indies and the Spanish mainland. Initially referring to landless hunters that made a living hunting boar or cattle on Tortuga and Española. The term buccaneer came to describe the Brethren of the Coast, which was a loose alliance of pirates and privateers. Here in Indiana, buccaneers just overpriced corn at the farmer's market. Uh Uh-huh. Sorry. I laugh like Fran Drescher. (laughs) If you remember our Queen Elizabeth I episode, you'll remember that the Spanish were not one to be messed with. They were an extremely powerful force with the belief that God was backing them as did everyone else. This is also the time that Jean David started going by his new drag name, Francois Lolonet, except his death drops actually involved dead bodies, but he got tipped well. I am sorry, but during this research, I discovered pirates are drag queens. They wear creative and unique costumes, perform amazing stunts with shiny accessories, and are gone once the show is over and the tips are collected usually to get drunk and play with their secret cave. If I had a dollar for every time I've done the exact same thing, hey, I'm a pirate, Oh, Ahoy matey, man ho. <laughs> anyway, Francois's ruthless streak saw him advanced rapidly amongst the buccaneers, predominantly raiding Spanish colonists. He was even given command of a small ship by the governor of Tortuga, and Lolonese gained a fearsome reputation for slaughtering the entire crew of any ship he captured. Even for a pirate, he was as ruthless as they come. Who hurt you, sir? In 1663, his vessel became marooned on the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. They were then spotted by Spanish ships patrolling and full of soldiers. At the end of their very brief battle, The entire pirate crew was eliminated, aside from our Captain Francois. He quite literally covered himself with the warm blood of his crew and hid among their fresh corpses. Just curious, would you be able to do something like that to save yourself? Just out of curiosity, honestly. I would. Hell yeah. If it meant that or my own demise, I would play possum all day long. Honestly, though, the blood I could get past, you'd get used to it after a little while. But did you know that when things pass away, their bowels and bladders empty? That would be a pretty gross and smelly dog pile. But I've been to a bathhouse or two. There's no difference. He then made his way somehow to the port city of Campeche. And there he assembled a new crew of escaped slaves and returned to Tortuga. I'm picking this as a positive note. He was bloodthirsty and ruthless, but he wasn't racist. Hmm, racists are literally worse than an uneducated deadly pirate from the 1600s. Feel your shame and feel it deep. Shame, shame, shame. Now, our boy Francois was an equal opportunity buccaneer. He not only plundered loot from Spanish ships, but he was one of the few with enough gumption to attack settlements on land. After he had sacked one and demanded ransom for the release of the occupants to the settlement, the governor of Havana sent out a crew to capture the pirate by any means necessary. They were all savagely murdered by beheading aside from one. Lolonese made him watch as his fellow team was killed. He was then sent back with a message for the governor. Lolonese would never show quarter to any Spaniard he encountered. By the year 1666, Lolonese would be the commander of a fleet that consisted of eight ships as well as several hundred pirates. To put that into perspective, I went to a small high school in the middle of fields and cow farms. There were maybe... 500 students on a good year in the whole building. This man had more pirates under his control than a small town has students. That's astounding to me, the sheer number of pirates that there were at this time. 
fascinating, actually. This was all part of history that is known as the Golden Age of Piracy, by the way. Some more fun facts I came across real fast. Pirates are known as enemies of all mankind, and currently, countries have what is called universal jurisdiction, where any country can seize any pirate ship, haul them back to their land, and try them in their own national courts. I just thought that was really cool. With the full power of all his forces, Lolonese turned his sights to the coastal city of Maracabo. Now, this is not just a city by a beach. They had money and they had defenses to protect it. And it was called the San Carlos de la Barra Fortress, which was heavily armored, star-shaped, made out of limestone, and had 16 cannons ready to fire on any pirates that attempted to sack the place. The thing was, though, pirates, don't they usually attack from the sea? And the fortress was more than prepared for that. But Lolonese was one of the few cunning enough to come up through land. That's precisely what he did, too, as he and his crew were able to take the fortress in just a few short hours. I feel like the men who built the fortress, though, should have consulted at least one wife or a woman somewhere before committing to that design. I can just hear a woman standing by watching them and like, It looks great, honey. Completely safe from all sea attacks. But what if they come by land? I can just see those men, like, not even thinking about that. Like, who would come up by land? They're pirates. Always get a second opinion, people. Many of the townsfolk were able to flee or at least hide their valuables. A move that they would pay severely for when they were captured. Our dreaded pirate Lillonese used this as an opportunity to feed his appetite for torture. He spent nearly two months capturing those who fled and torturing them into revealing their hidden treasures. Lillonese then fled across Lake Maracabo towards San Antonio de Gibraltar on its southern banks. His final count of plunder from the fortress was 20,000 pieces of eight they received as ransom and around 260,000 pieces of eight they managed to torture out of citizens, plus jewels, valuables, free slaves who also joined their crew. At the time, the Spanish dollar was also known as a piece of eight or peso, is a silver coin worth eight Spanish real. It is widely used to the uniformity and standard and milling characteristics. Beginning in 1537, the pieces of eight were supplemented by the gold esquado, which was worth about two dollars. The more you know. His reputation was ever-growing. He was famous for his wealth that he brought to those who aided him, and in his next endeavor, he wanted to attack the coast of Honduras. He had over 700 people fighting with him, again, even more than before. Sadly, though, For his men, they were successful in the raid, but they were ambushed by the Spanish directly after. Most of them were killed aside from their captain and a lucky few. He then managed to take two Spanish soldiers hostage and made his escape. These poor men that he captured, my god. This next part is like something out of a horror movie. Viewer discretion advised. As soon as he was clear from his captures, he decided to take all of his anger out onto his two hostages. He made one of them watch as he hacked open the chest cavity of the other. He then reached in, pulled out his still beating heart, and took a bite out of it. What gets me thinking about this is where in the world did this appetite for torture come from? I know a lot of his childhood is unknown, but good gravy. What happened to you, sir, for your mind to believe that this was an acceptable way to treat anything, especially another human? The surviving Spanish soldier, of course, obeyed every order after that. I mean, who wouldn't after you just saw what happened to your friend? He leads Lolone and his few men along a safe route to the port of San Pedro. Being so few in numbers, they were unsuccessful in the raid and had to retreat. And during his escape, he ran aground on a shoal in the Pearl Keys from Nicaragua, the coast of what is today Panama. 
Unable to free their ship, Lolonazan and a few remaining men were then forced to abandon their ship and head ashore to find food. From here, he ran several operational attacks on different cities like Guatemala and San Pedro Sula. He tried to penetrate Nicaragua's inland cities through the Nicaraguan River and was defeated and almost killed by the natives of the region. He escaped them and went to Cartinja in Colombia, still searching for food. It would seem all those riches he had acquired weren't doing him any good now, were they? Can't buy food if there isn't anything you can buy, can you, big fella? He didn't, to me, seem to be honestly the forager type, so I'm assuming, just assuming, he was reliant on bot food only. While still on their search for food, Lolone and his men were captured by the native tribe called the Kuna tribe. When the Spaniards arrived, the Kuna lived primarily near the Gulf of Uraba, in what is today Colombia. Contact with the Spanish began in the 1600s, and as you can imagine, it was violent and trade was very limited. Fleeing from the Spaniards, the Kuna traveled up the jungle rivers and settled in the Darien region of what is now Panama. Let's just say they were not fans of outsiders. Our dreaded pirate king, Francois Lelonnet, and his men were then butchered, and their appendages were cut off one by one and thrown into a raging fire. Oh my god, you look like the 4th of July. It makes me want a hot dog real bad. Then, those ashes were scattered, leaving no trace aside from their buried treasures. All that bloodshed and darkness in pursuit of wealth, but all the money in the world, could not protect them from their fate. Francois Lelonais was dead and gone at the assumed age of 39. The average lifespan in 1669 was about 43 years old, so he still would have been considered an old man. Only the good die young though, and he was so far from good, he was rotten. So my darlings, did you enjoy our lesson today? I hope so. I know I learned that I shouldn't ever live just for wealth. It's great to be comfortable and have security, but pursuing it has led humanity to commit some genuinely evil acts against each other, against nature and our own planet, honestly. Let's leave a better world for those who will come after us and live for each other instead. I'm Joshua Waters, and thank you again so very much for joining me on this historical journey into the life of Francois Lelonnais, the French pirate who met a fitting end to all of his bloodshed and crimes, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. If you would like to stay up to date on our current episodes of Rotten to the Core or have suggestions for future ones, please follow and like us on Facebook at It's Rotten to the Core, Instagram at It's Rotten to the Core, Twitter at Rotten in History, or It's Rotten to the Core.com. We also have a Patreon if you would like to support the podcast at patreon.com slash It's Rotten to the Core. Check out some of our other podcasts, too, at itsarclightmedia.com. Ahoy, mateys!